Hi, everyone, and welcome. Today we're presenting, or Parks and Recreation Ontario is presenting this webinar on managing frontline staff in an after-school setting. This webinar is made possible through the On After School Project, led by the Leisure Information Network and supported by the Government of Ontario and Public Health Agency of Canada. Please note this webinar session will be recorded and made available on the Ontario After School web portal at www.onafterschool.ca and I'll add that information in the chat pod. My name is Jennifer Peltier and I'm the Education Training Specialist at Parks and Recreation Ontario. I'm also your host for today's event. Should you have any technical questions at all, please feel free to share those in the chat pod at any time throughout the presentation. I'd like to mention a few important items before we begin. During today's webinar, we ask that you all, or all of you that are joining us over the telephone, remain muted as to eliminate any possible background noise. You can mute your lines by selecting star six. You are all currently muted, so you don't need to select that at this time. But for should some for some reason you become unmuted, um, you can select star six to mute, and then to unmute your line, you can star six again. There will be some time at the end of the presentation for questions. However, feel free to add questions to the chat pod at any time today. Also, our presenters have included some questions for you to share thoughts. So if a poll pops up on your screen, simply select your answers by clicking the circle next to your choice, and we will automatically see the results on the screen. All responses to polls are anonymous. And lastly, there will be an evaluation at the end of the presentation. Please take a moment to complete this, as some of the information will be used towards some future webinars for after-school staff. Now I'm pleased to start and introduce our presenters. Anna Storino is a kinesiology major and has spent the last 23 years working in the field with children and youth programs. Anna has extensive experience in designing, delivering, and evaluating programs for children and youth of all ages, backgrounds, and needs. Currently, Anna is at the St. Albans Boys and Girls Club. She began there as the social development coordinator five years, for five years, and then the program director for five years, and three years ago was promoted to the director of operations and helps oversee an organization with the main location 18 satellite locations and two pools that offer programs to all ages from 0 to 25 and up across the city of Toronto to more than 3,000 members. Jennifer Drummond is also our presenter today. Jennifer is the program manager with the Beyond 330 West program at the Toronto Foundation for Student Success. She has a BA in International Studies. Jennifer has worked as a program coordinator with Canada World Youth and Katimovic. She is an entrepreneur and has over 20 years experience with programming and facilitation. Anna and Jennifer, are you with us? Yeah, I'm with Hi, you. Jennifer. Hello, everybody. Okay, great. So I turn it over to you both. Great, thank you. Great. Well, it's fantastic to have everybody here today, and uh, I hope that you get something out of it, and it's wonderful seeing everybody um, connecting via the chat. Um, we're hoping to uh, interact with you a little bit more as well, but let's get right to it because uh, we have a lot of stuff to cover for you. So one of the biggest problems that people have is staff recruitment and the process of finding or hiring uh, in a timely manner the best qualified candidates with, from within or outside of your organization. And people seem to have a real difficulty uh, in the after-school recreation department of finding the right people and, and maintaining them. So we want to hopefully give you some ideas on how to keep that going. Um, what, I, what you need to do is to have a well-defined post uh, uh, position posting and make sure that you have the exact job requirements so people know exactly what they're getting into and what you expect from them but also what qualifications you want for them. This will really help you out in filtering in the yes or no questions to fine tune the job parameters, but also when you're going further on and you're looking through resumes. If, you've, if you want to really fine tune a, your, your posting, check out a Google search for job postings, but as well, every, all the people know each other, ask your colleagues who are at other organizations if they're willing to pass on their job posting and that might help you as well. 
Good afternoon, everyone. It's Anna. Thank you for joining us today. And hopefully it's not too cold and bitter out there across the province. Um, now we're just going to touch a bit about uh, staff recruitment, how to get the word out both internally and externally. Um, please note that it's really important to also post internally first. Give those opportunities to the staff that you have in-house that you've spent all the time and financial money on training them and giving them the right tools to succeed. Give them the opportunity, then post it externally as well. Also keep in mind that there might be some past employees that you weren't able to give opportunities to, and now that you can, it would be great to connect with them as well. Um, look at connecting with friends or anyone who's very familiar with the organization that you run and your mission and the services. They at times will know people that you might not be aware of and they will help circulate the resume. Um, sorry, the job posting. Also look at staff and other stakeholders, both past and current. Any other partners that you may have, they might have people in-house that they're not able to offer the next level or the next step to them. Look to employment centers, colleges and universities. Ensure that you're applying and sending out the job postings to the key departments that are very specific and that their teachables are what you're looking for. For example, kinesiology departments, teaching departments, child and youth worker, social services, and et cetera. Also look at distributing it in the neighborhood that you serve to any of the community groups that you know of or that you sit on, any of the high schools that you work with, the guidance counselors, the administration staff, um, and any of the teachers, they might have people in mind as well. Also share with the service delivery partners that you're working with. Um, if you share a program location, I know for us, we're in um, multiples of schools or trauma community housing, so you've got a whole pool of other staff that are working for other agencies as well. So share the postings with them. Um, look at social media, which you'll be able to sort of reach a larger audience. I know with us, we look at Twitter, Facebook, and website, and it'd be amazing how many responses you get through that avenue. And just be very honest with everyone you're sending out um, you're putting out postings, you might be receiving resumes at all times throughout the year. Just let them know that you may not be looking for this position at this time, but that you will be holding on to their resume for any future references. Okay, so with um, tips for reviewing and the interview process, you really want to create an A and a B pile. Um, a lot of the times you're going to get some really fantastic people who on paper look really great, um, but then you're going to have a B pile that it's especially if you do a really wide net, you might get a whole bunch of people who have never actually worked with kids sending you in um, sending you in uh, their resumes. So you definitely want to put them in the B pile so that you don't have to do it. And if you have questions, you can be able to really filter through that fast. Uh, when you're actually interviewing, you really do want to ask questions that are actually going to give you the answers that you desire. So be very careful. So try and figure out what it is you want to get out of them and then shape your question around that. One thing that can really help is uh, scheduling a, a phone pre-interview with them because that will also help you weed out and it can be really short and it takes a lot less time than doing an in than doing an in-house um, or face-to-face -face interview. And you want to include both technical and scenario questions. Um, so just general questions in regards to what their skills are, but also scenario questions that you know are going to be relevant to your actual uh, position that you're offering or to the site that you're offering or the client that you work with. Okay? On to Anna. Yeah, hey Jen. We're going to continue on with the tips for the review and interview process. So when looking at the two different types of interviews that you may be having with either frontline staff that you're looking to hire or in, within the managerial area, with the frontline staff, ensure that there's always a second person with you. Um, you, can all, you can do one interview process and then hire, and we also suggest that you try and do an unpaid shadowing session where you have them come in, have them shadow with some of your stronger leaders and staff, and then receive some feedback from those leaders and staff or supervisors as to how they integrated themselves, how they engaged. At times, people can talk the talk but obviously can't walk the walk, and it's always great to see them actually um, in-house and working and see how they kind of communicate with the children, the staff, and with the community at large. 
If you're looking at a managerial position, we stress, we do stress that you do sort of a two-interview tier system if you can. Ensure that you've always got a second or third person in with you in the interview, depending on um, what level you're hiring for. We suggest that the first interview, you basically are getting to know them, let them share their experiences and their successes with you. Um, we stress that you really look at whether or not they fit the current team that you have. Um, the last thing you'd want to do is bring in a member who may have all the qualifications and skill sets but may not fit the team dynamic because you're always able to sort of give them the opportunity to develop and grow within those skills. Then we suggest that you narrow your candidates down to maybe two or three um, and then run a second set of interviews where you have them come in and you give them questions to prepare ahead of time and ensure that these questions reflect the skill sets or responsibilities that they may have in their job role. They will come back to the interview they will present, and then you can move forward with questions from there. Um, also create a supply list of candidates. Obviously, this is for your frontline staff. Keep them on hand. Um, be very specific with them and let them know that they will be supply staff that could come in um, when other staff are on vacation or they've got exams going on or um, some sort of family incident happens where you need someone to fill in. This group can then become the group that you can start offering the internal postings to. They then can become the next chair of your frontline staff. But be very clear with the list of supply staff that they understand that they are on supply until um, further notice. Um, inform and thank any of the unsuccessful candidates, whatever is easiest for you, via email or just a very quick phone call. Most people find the email process to be simpler for them. And we just wanted to ask everyone a little quick question now. I want some input from everybody. What are your biggest challenges when recruiting staff? Yeah, so there's tons of people writing now, so that's fantastic. And uh, we really want to, because we know everyone has their own uh, challenges, and I'm sure some of us have definitely overlapping challenges. I know that, uh, just to fill in this, I know that a lot of times it's uh, turnover and experience. Yes, Dominique, for sure. Yeah, and the hours that the program is run, exactly. It's not a lot of time, and it's not necessarily a lot of money. Yeah. Getting staff committed to limited hours per day, that's the biggest one we find. It's not worth their while coming in for the two to three hours, so sometimes we try and overlap giving them roles or responsibilities or hours within other departments. So it's really key that you talk to your other managers or supervisors and see if there's anything available where you can then add some hours um, from after school time to evening hours as well. Well, that's interesting. I guess staff that overlap, working for two different departments, working for the school board and then canceling their shifts, that's, that's a tough one, but I think you have to be very clear with them that if they've made a commitment to your organization, then they've got to see that through. And if you realize that they don't, sometimes it's easier just to let them go and bring someone in that will be committed to your agency. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, again, when they have multiple uh, multiple responsibilities, school, another job, aspects like that, sometimes that can help in regards to just being really clear in regards to what your expectations are for them. Mm -hmm. And it doesn't mean that you have to be a stickler. You can have some flexibility, in particular if you have a supply staff roster. Um, but, uh, yeah, it's really hard to, uh, you, you just have to be really clear with them. Good mm -hmm. stuff <laughs> Jennifer just mentioned about um, covering shifts during vacation or March break and Christmas. Uh, it is difficult, and that's why your supply list sometimes will really want to jump on that as much as they can. And then you can also look at, I know in some situations, if you've got university students, sometimes they should be available during the March break. They kind of overlap. Reading week is earlier than March break. The Christmas break is always difficult, but I think you've got some staff that um, really need the extra money that would be jumping at it. Yeah, and also that difficulty of finding people who have the exact skills but also fit. Yeah, there really is a, a, a bouncing or a, a juggling act that needs to happen. A lot of times when you do find things like that is like really zoning in on those particular community organizations where you know they might actually have people with those particular skills 
and maybe interested in the hours that, that you offer. And that could also be a component that you throw into your staff training, your ongoing development with them, where if you realize they need some more skill sets or more resources on working with children, then you can add that into your training component. Well, that looks like we've had lots of people yeah. uh, adding stuff in. Thank you very much for, for participating and giving us some of your great ideas and also sharing some of the challenges that you have. Um, we know it's an ongoing thing, and uh, hopefully some, you'll get some ideas today. We're going to move into staff retention. And once you get the staff, you got to keep them. <laughs> That's one of the big things that happens. And stuff re that pretty much just the, the definition is uh, an organization's ability to retain its staff, thus decreased turnover, training uh, recruitment costs, and loss of talent and uh, organizational knowledge. And it's always wonderful when you can actually recruit within because they have that organizational knowledge. They know exactly what is needed. They usually can sometimes have that flexibility. So sometimes it's wonderful, uh, and it's a great way to also um, look at your current staff and say, you know, we appreciate the work that you're doing, so we have a position that's maybe a little bit higher skilled. Um, and so we're going to open it up to our staff and, and, and as well um, recruit internally. That can sometimes help, um, and it helps the organization as well. But, um, you know, retention helps with, with as well before the staff do. So the managers pave the way. I mean, if you have, you have to really make sure that your managers um, are good and are a good fit in regards to managing the, the frontline staff that they actually have, um, that they can help coach, that they can set clear uh, and communicate the clear goals that they have for their staff. It's not uh, wishy-washy. Everyone should be fairly, should be on the same page of what is expected of them. And then it can help along the way where they don't feel like um, the expectations that, that are being asked of them are unrealistic. Um, and staff need to understand uh, your mission and goals. I mean, it's really important that your organization shares with uh, your frontline staff what you're trying to accomplish as a program uh, and to make sure that they're clear on that, that they are part of something that is bigger and uh, that the work that they do is very much directly related to the mission and the goals of the organization. So making sure that they understand. Don't just read it to them, but also talk about it so that they have um, more of a personal connection with it. Um, and as well, you know, you really want to hire for attitude and train for skills. I'm sure there's a ton of people who have seen people on paper and they do a really fantastic interview. And uh, on paper, they're fantastic. They're like, oh my god, <laughs> you know, this is fantastic. This is the per perfect person for this particular area. And then when you see them interacting with the kids or even with the other staff, they can be standoffish or they're afraid of the children um, and they, uh, they are having a really difficult time in regards to fitting in. And, I, and Anna mentioned this before, that they don't fit in in the managerial way, but also this can happen with the frontline staff. Um, and being aware and looking for some of those things. Sometimes it's just um, growing pains and they grow out of it. But as managers and in particular um, upper managers, you start to get a, a sixth sense about these different things. Okay? So I'm going to turn it over to Anna now. Okay, thanks, Jen. Um, and continuing with the staff retention, um, what's actually quite important, and I think we're on the wrong slide, you guys. Sorry. Oh, hold on. Okay, apologize for that, you guys. That was on my end. Um, what's actually quite crucial is invest in your frontline staff. Let them know that you understand how important the work is that they're doing. And by investing, we mean things provide and offer ongoing training and professional development. Give them opportunities to grow. Let them excel. Make sure that you're noting where their strong sets are and give them those opportunities to develop those skill sets. Um, offer ongoing training during the PA days. Um, during the holiday breaks, you're able to bring them in. If you're able to ever do a Saturday or Sunday, some staff are not too keen on that, but every once in a while, if it's a great certification that you're giving them, I think most staff would be willing to come in and do that. 
help staff network with their peers. Um, with so many of our sites and locations now being all across the city and across the province, give them an opportunity to come together with their peers and share their experiences, tell their stories, and help them come to a conclusion of um, different ideas or issues that have helped them through difficulties or through program issues. Let them learn from each other so that they then know that as an organization, you respect what they have to offer and their education and their abilities. Um, as a supervisor or manager, you also want to create a culture that values the staff that you've hired. Um, engage your staff. Provide them with challenging obstacles and more responsibilities. Try not to micromanage as much and keep in mind why you've hired them. You've hired them because you believe that they're the right candidate for that position. You believe they've got the skill set, they can do the job. Keep in mind that highly engaged employees will always be more productive. Um, communication is crucial and it must be ongoing. This is one of the key factors in retaining your staff. Um, make the time for the weekly team meetings. Ensure that the communication is both ways where they're able to openly communicate with you, um, give you any suggestions or ideas. Set up an open door policy from top down within the organization so that anyone can share any thoughts or process or bring any issues to the forefront. Um, and ensure that you're listening to them and addressing the issues that they've informed you about. Keep your staff informed. It's really important that they understand the ins and outs of the organization so that they, in turn, can understand why at times things may not be able to happen or things may be able to happen, and they'll be able to deliver their programs in a better manner, and they also will be able to communicate that to the community that they're working with. Um, staff must be heard. Um, make sure that they feel that their concerns and suggestions are being heard and that they have the impact and the opportunity to bring change to the organization. Being able to speak freely is key. If they're terrified of their supervisor, if they're terrified of the consequences of them speaking up, um, most staff will not come and voice any issues that are happening and that you'll find that these staff are the staff that will leave the organization quickly. Um, informed staff are your greatest ambassadors. Update them on any ongoings, whether it's great successes or challenges that the organization is happening. Um, they'll better understand why things can or cannot happen, especially when it becomes a budget issue or a space issue. If you give them the information behind why your answer may be no at that time, they will greatly appreciate that, and then they'll deliver their programs in a better manner. Um, consider newsletters to celebrate and share the staff. Um, even if it's little updates or little bios on the staff or the successes. I know we have um, weekly updates here where our after school manager actually does a little photo and then talks about an activity that each leader has led that week and there's photos of the kids and then quotes from the kids themselves. Um, highlight the great work the staff are doing in the programs. That's always really key. Um, help staff understand the funding process. The better understanding they have of that, the better production you're going to have from the staff. Keep them informed on the organization. Any changes that may be happening that will affect their programs or their program budget, um, and they'll have a clear understanding of why things are the way they are within the organization. Jen? So um, this all helps towards getting a retaining your staff and motivating them. So now we have a poll that we'd like you to uh, do. We'd like you to uh, answer what are, the, what are your top two strategies when retaining or motivating your staff? Because I'm sure you're doing something right now. So if you could just click on the top two things that you actually do that you think work. And so we're using your experience and your expertise to um, make sure that uh, we're getting it out there. So we have open communication is at 55% now, and recognition is at 40, 45, oh, it's bouncing back and forth. Uh, <laughs> come on, come on, look at that. <laughs> so, yeah, we definitely have open communication, and that's something that, that both uh, Anna and I have talked about, that it really does have to be a, a two-way street, and you have to find different things. We know that, you know, there's always that instringent thing in regards to where people, just because, just for the sheer fact that there's a power dynamic in regards to um, someone being a supervisor and someone not being a supervisor, that sometimes people automatically get that. So you want to try and set it up so that they do feel comfortable talking to you or have different uh, avenues. 
So we definitely have the winners being open communication and then recognize, uh, recognizing them and then rewards and then fairness and equitable treatment. And those are all very important. Um, so they're really good ways of making sure that the, the staff uh, really feel like they're part of it. So thank you very much for participating. And uh, we're going to move on to the next one is essentially morale. So still under the staff retention. And, you know, an emotional condition with respect to chillfulness, confidence, zeal, uh, especially in the face of opposition and hardship and discouragement. If your staff are motivated and their morale is high, then you're going to have better run programs, higher staff uh, participation. They're going to be working much harder to make sure that they're happy, but also that the clients you work with and the participants you work with are going to be happy. And uh, and so you want to try and make sure that it's, uh, it's a good job because the reality is most people don't do this for the money, right? They do this because it feeds their soul. So you want to make sure that it continues to feed their soul as they go further on. And I'm going to pass it on to Anna now. Thanks, Jennifer. Um, continuing with the staff morale, staff morale is influenced by the perception of fairness and equitable treatment. Um, ensure that you keep the staff, um, or intention is to provide equal opportunities and training. If you're going to provide it for one, you've got to provide it for the entire team because this could cause a rift between the team itself. Um, the amount of supervision received by the staff, make sure that it's quality supervision versus micromanaging. Provide support and assistance where you feel it's needed. You'll know the strengths and the challenges of your team, so um, keep that in mind when you're providing supervision for them. Remember and remind yourself why you hired them. Trust in their skill sets um, and ensure that you're available to them, whether you're available to them in person um, or via email or text. It's crucial during those programming hours, and because so many of us now service so many different satellite locations, it's not possible for us to be at every location um, at all times, but let them know the best way to get in touch with me is either on my phone or by email. Just un have an understanding that they know that they can reach you at any time for support. Um, and most importantly, the four R&B principles, recognize your staff. Various small and small ways that you can do it, whether it's a staff of the month, you post their picture up, you put it out on the newsletter, on the website, um, you put a little blog or story about that staff of the month, you can give them a little gift card to a Tim Hortons or a Starbucks, whatever it is that um, seems to be the, the need of the staff that you have. Mention it in the team meetings. I know here we actually make it a peer vote where the team itself will vote for the staff of the month, and at times that means more to them. Um, reward them, like we, I just mentioned earlier, with little gift cards. Give them the opportunities, more responsibilities within the organization. Sometimes it could be more shifts, um, a different level or different positions within the organization. And reinforce the right behavior. Overall, celebrate success as an organization and make sure that you're doing that all around for everyone. And recognition. Recognition can come in a multitude of different uh, um different uh, modalities or, or facets. And I think uh, Anna mentioned quite a few in regards to, uh, you know, you want to recognize for what they're doing because when they feel that they're recognized and they're valued, then they're going to achieve more. Uh, they they want to do a good job. They have personal uh, a personal goal in, in doing a good job and providing a good program. Uh, you also want to recognize their skills and their talents and their experience. Um, a lot of the times, in, in particular as a manager, you might make sure that you, if you're having a problem and something needs to be shifted around, ask them, what do you think you need? What can you do here? What sorts of things would change? Sometimes they might be uh, reticent to actually put something out there, but they, uh, if you offer it up to them, they might have a fantastic idea already. And then you want to recognize that brilliant idea and maybe share it with other other sites if you're working multiple, multiple, if you're working multiple sites like I have eight. Um, you want to be approachable and responsive uh, as, and you know, you want to make sure that they feel that they can actually talk to you and share those ideas with you because their ideas are probably pretty incredible. And you want to encourage the staff to think independently and making sure that, um, you know, that, that we love the fact that they've got ideas of their own because then they can facilitate them really well. We don't have to hand hold them. 
and let the know, let make sure you know that the staff knows that they're valued and the work that they're doing has a value. I think sometimes staff forget that the work that they're actually doing with the children themselves has a value and that and how it really actually uh, impacts the, the, the work and the children that they're working with. Uh, staff retention, again, is, you know, you want to recognize the monthly awards, assemblies, warm, fuzzy moments uh, where you get everyone to say something wonderful about them. And also realize how your staff um, might be um, motivated. They might, it might be in stringent uh, recognition where it's like they need to have personal goals. They want to actually own, have ownership of the program itself and that actually gets them um, going and motivates them. And then there are going to be others who actually, you know, they love the bonuses or the gift cards and, uh, or a staff chart where you can see, you know, the little gold star thing sometimes still works for people even as they get older. So be aware of those things. Yeah. Anna. Thanks, Jen. Um, we're going to move on to motivation as well. A definition of it, to motivate means to provide with a motive or motives to incite or impel. And I think incite is a key term there that I think we should always think about. Um, and this little equation, motivation, achievement, fulfillment, satisfaction, and happiness. This is a model that I think any organization or agency that works with children and youth should live by in the workforce. Um, provide them with the right tools and training and the right resources so that they can succeed in their roles and ensure that you place the right staff in the right position and that will definitely lead to fulfillment, satisfaction, and happiness for the entire team overall. Um, everyone's heard this saying, a happy workforce equals happy clients, and that's what we're there for, the clients that we're servicing. This, You'll see this become the outcome of your programs, and you're going to be getting positive feedback from the children, from the parents, and the community at large, and they will continue to come and attend your programs, and the reputation within the community of your programs will only be positive. Um, positive attitudes must flow from the top down, starting with your supervisors, your EDs, your CEO. Um, as a supervisor, you set that tone. You're the face that they see. You're the voice that they hear. So any kind of tone, body language, or any conversations that you're having with your staff, ensure that it's always positive. It's a safe, positive environment that they're working in. Um, and offer them that environment at all times and ensure that that's the example that you're setting for them. Um, if not, it can become infectious um, throughout the organization. Um, we find sometimes that you may have one staff that can start off as a bad seed that we call it and it can continue and the issues will grow and grow and it will basically um, infect the entire organization. And at times, sometimes it's just easier to cut them off, let them go. Sometimes they may be some of your stronger staff and unfortunately they're sort of the reason why it's now become a toxic environment and it's just easier um, up in the front, just let them go and then start over from there. Nurture a positive environment, um, regular check-ins, have team huddles, whether it's just five minutes before a shift or five minutes after a shift. We know that everyone is so busy with their lives. They've got other responsibilities, they've got families, they've got class, they're running to other jobs. Just take those five minutes, make it part of their job responsibility to participate in those five minutes. Um, you can call it a team huddle, you can give it a cute little name, whatever it is that you want to have. Um, team meetings are crucial. This is sometimes where you get some of the most important information coming back to you that you're not aware of. Try and have them weekly if you can. Sometimes it's difficult because of all the satellite locations, so find a way um, to touch base with the entire team at least once a week and provide a venue where you have regular communication with your frontline staff and the supervisors. Check in daily, even if you're not at that site or location, just, hey, hi, how are you? How's your day going? You know, any great things you want to share with me today? Um, listen to the staff. They're committed when they feel that they've contributed their ideas and that they've shared um, their program successes with you. Nurture and develop the staff skills, so fine-tune the areas that you know that they excel at. Keep things fresh, and that's always really challenging um, for supervisors and managers. So find ways to keep it fresh, offer new challenges and new opportunities, and keep bringing things at the forefront for your team. Keep staff updated and focus on their roles at all times. Now we're going to move into uh, staff support. And essentially, the definition of staff support is, um, 
you know, maintaining someone or something by supplying them the means or necessities for success or existence. Okay? Essentially, how you demonstrate that is by providing the staff with the right tools and skills for their roles. So trying to make sure that they actually have enough, um, enough, uh, uh, the actual equipment that they need, the training that they need, the information that they need. You know, if you're in a partnership with, say, for example, a school in a shared space, you need, they need to know what the permit looks like sort of things like that so that they actually have some idea. They need to be able to connect with the principal so that they know what the school rules are so that they're actually being able to be able to do their right, their job correctly and feel good about what they're doing, you know. Um, you want to place the right person in the right role. And this is incredibly important. I think uh, we, we discussed it earlier. Um, but you really want to make sure that you've got that right person. If you have a particularly challenging um, environment or program that you're working with, you want to make sure that the staff person who seems to be a little bit loosey-goosey in regards to code to conduct might not be the person to work there. Uh, you might need to make sure you find a person who can be firm but fair and fun with the kids um, and to make sure that they can actually do it. Or you might not necessarily want to put uh, all staff who all the, the, their sport of choice is basketball and no one knows anything about arts and crafts or about cooking. And so the programming is going to get very streamlined, even though you might not want it. So you want to make sure that you've got that right person there. Um, and you want to be able to you know, provide greater challenges, making sure that they can actually develop themselves, keep things fresh, uh, and uh, letting them change things around, and maybe even just suggesting to change things around. And they'll, they'll usually jump on it and go, oh, OK, that sounds really fantastic. Like I know at our sites, um, the kids were getting bored with the programming and one of our staff people came up with this great idea to do a thing called the Amazing Race and got the kids into little teams and they did these things called Amazing Race and it would be a whole day event and it would incorporate all different components of the program and the kids love it. So then they started having Freaky Fridays uh, where they would do something fun and exciting that would involve some kind of team activities and the kids loved it and the staff loved it because they got so excited. Um, they were almost as excited as the kids were. Um, and you want to definitely step into the staff work, the work roles occasionally. Uh, a lot of times what happens is that the staff think we're front line, you have no idea what we're actually dealing with. So you want to actually, you know, really make sure that they do, that they, you're showing them that you do understand what's happening and you want to be able to really understand what they're dealing with on a day to day basis by stepping into that role and working with them. Uh, and, you know, letting them definitely take the lead if they're the normal lead there. You don't want to step on their feet, but you want to be there and do some frontline stuff. And that can go a long way in regards to supporting, but also motivating your staff. Thanks, Jen. We're going to move on to staff supervision. Um, staff, staff supervision, overseeing a process, a project, workers, et cetera, during execution or performance. And some key areas in this are ensuring that the staff know agency policies and procedures. Ensure that they actually review the policies and procedures manual and make sure that they're doing it. You know that they're doing it. Have them actually sign off that they've read and they have an understanding of this. Give them a certain time lot where they can come back and ask any questions or any clarifications that they may have. I know with our agency, we have them sign off that they've read and understood the procedures and that they've met with their supervisor and have addressed any questions, and we put that sign-off form in their file. Um, and make sure that there's always a copy that's accessible to the staff at each site. They're able to get their hands on one just in case there's a question that they may have and the site supervisor is not there immediately just for them to address those questions at that time. Capitalize on teachable moments for your staff. Um, address an issue um, when it happens. Don't wait a few days or don't wait for the team meeting to address that issue. Um, and address it in a positive tone. Discuss the issue privately with the staff or with the leaders at that time. And if it's appropriate, you can use this as a teachable moment in your team meetings. You can then communicate or reinforce the policy or procedure that you want to ensure that everyone has a clear understanding how to follow through with those procedures and policy with your team. Treat all staff consistently. We touched upon, um, upon this a bit earlier. Um, ensure that if any problems occur, that all staff are treated equally and they're treated in the same manner and 
within the same procedures. If they're treated differently for when they're requesting vacation time off or continued education, um, so this could cause a big rift between your team. And uh, as the saying goes, you're only as strong as your weakest link. And ensure that whenever you're dealing with any of these issues, you refer back to the employee handbook so that you keep it consistent and that you don't kind of fall off in the trap of, you know, treating staff differently in that manner. Also, developing strong processes for yourself and for the organization is key, especially when we have a high turnover of staff. I know sometimes here from December to January, um, because of university schedules um, changing up, that there's usually a turnover. So if you cross-train all your staff, you document all the procedures, you have everyone in place, um, the transitions will happen a bit more smoothly. And it's easier to transition in and out of roles if everything is documented, recorded, and filed for yourself and for the organization. Jen? Yep. Sorry. <laughs> There's staff supervision. Uh, I was just taking my phone off of mute so that we don't cross over. Uh, staff supervision. You want to ensure that the work, workplace is safe and, and that the staff themselves are actually knowledgeable about the safety. Um, so this is something that you definitely want to make sure that you do so that staff, uh, you know, are really sure about what they're doing and that they are feeling safe. You also want to invite staff uh, input and feedback. So this is something that you can do when you're actually sitting down with somebody, you're doing your, uh, your, your feedback. You can do um, Survey Monkey where you can put out a number of things so it can be anonymous so that you can actually get some real um, real feedback where they don't have to feel that they, you know, I can't actually say that to my supervisor, uh, but something that can actually contribute very well to the, the organization and to the programming. And you also want to address uh, performance issues directly. You don't want to be sending out a notice. I've noticed that a lot of people have been doing this, blah, blah, blah. Um, if you notice it in one person in particular, then you give them a telephone call or you go and you meet them in person and you actually talk to them directly about a performance issue um, so that it's very clear and it's back to that communication which won that poll. Uh, it's being very clear about uh, what your expectations are and where you're going and what you expect from your staff so that they're not second guessing but not going, oh, is that me or oh, is that, am I doing this right or am I doing this wrong? Now, at this point, you're probably all really sick of hearing my voice, and uh, so we have a poll for you that we'd like to ask you. And uh, you can just click on uh, some of the things that you, you want. You know, what problems have you encountered when effective supervision has not taken place with your staff? So you want to think about what actually can happen, and you can press as many as you like, <laughs> but maybe to do one or two, that might be great. Um, what sorts of things you've actually seen that have happened? And we have, you know, problems with the program and funding partners, uh, increase in incidents, decline in participation and the numbers of participants, uh, increase in complaints in par uh, from the parents or guardians, high staff turnover, increase in troubleshooting, um, where the manager yourself, you're actually out there doing stuff, and a negative impact on reputation of the organization. Those are a number of different things, and so we're wondering what's, what's one of the bigger things that you're dealing with. So right now, we definitely have a decline in participation, and as most of us know, we're getting, we're, most of us are nonprofit organizations in some level, way, shape, or form, where we get funding from external things, and so if we're not, we don't have the participants, then we actually can't run a program as well. So that's fantastic. Thank you very much for your feedback. That was the big one. The other one is a negative impact on reputation of the organization. Very good. So thanks a lot for doing that. And we'll move on to staff evaluation. Okay. Thanks, everyone, for participating in that poll. And it's interesting how it comes back down to the programs and services that we offer when uh, we aren't exactly always doing our jobs. We're going to move on now to staff evaluation. Um, evaluation, the assessment and review of a staff member's job or performance. And what's really key, key here is set clear times and locations, both for formal and informal evaluations that you're going to be doing with your team. Notify them that you're going to be doing evaluation. Don't just sort of surprise them. It's really not fair to them. Um, ensure that, you're, that you have a variety of informal visits. Even if it's just a chat, you're just popping in. If you have satellite locations, um, you just want to have sort of a pop-in. You might sit in. You might help out. You might engage. And include some of these informal um, 
sort of site visits or evaluations in the overall performance appraisal with your staff. So use them as an assessment, use them as a management tool for yourself when you're doing the formal evaluations with your staff and ensure that they have an input and they have a say in their formal evaluation. So ensure that both of you are taking notes. Supervisors taking notes, the frontline staff that's been evaluated is taking notes. And this is also a good comparison to make sure that you're both um, on the same page. There's times where they feel they're doing a wonderful job, yet there's things that you've seen that counter that. Or there's times where uh, you think they're doing an extremely well job, but they feel that they're lacking in certain areas. So it's always great to compare those notes and also to file those notes. It's very key as well to so ensure that um, both yourself and your frontline staff have signed off and those notes are filed in their files. Regular supervision should also feed into your yearly appraisal. So keep those regular visits, the notes, the, you know, document anything that you've seen, whether it's their successes or some challenges that you've seen the staff have or just within the program setting, and then add them into the yearly appraisal when you're meeting with your staff and in the reviews that you have with them. And make sure that they know that you've documented these and that um, you've seen these in your site visits or in your discussions with them. And ensure to document both successes and challenges, not only their challenges. Um, utilize a self-reflection checklist, which is really crucial. I know we do that with our staff here at the beginning of their contract, sort of where they feel their skill sets are when working with children and youth, and um, we sort of do it again midterm and at the end. And it's a nice comparison to see where they've grown as a staff and what resources and tools we've been able to offer them to grow professionally in that area as well. It also may help bring issues to the forefront for them where they feel that they've always been doing something, yet when they're now evaluating it or using the self-reflection checklist, they realize that they don't do this every day. Something as simple as using a child's name in a conversation as opposed to saying, hey, you, or hey, him, or her. I'm going to turn it over to Jen now. So continuing on with staff evaluation, when you are going to be evaluating them, you want to make sure that you're providing specific constructive feedback. It's like saying that, um, and even in a positive way, it's like, um, I like how you interact with the kids. And it's like, you can be a little bit more specific in regards to saying, you know, I saw that a number of the children came up to you and were really excited about sharing something that happened in their lives. And not only did you stop and take a look at them and sit down and look at them eye to eye, you actually got really excited and genuinely excited for them. And that kind of respect that you've created in the environment works really well. So try and be as specific as possible. You want to document underperformance um, and be specific about what you're documenting because you want to weed out the weak performers um, because the weak performers can bring the morale of the, the of other staff down. It can cause resentment because they feel that they have to step up to actually make sure that the program is good because they're caring about the kids. The kids can tell when staff are not interested and that might also bring out behavior problems which again cause is a, a cyclical and maybe a downward spiral in regards to how programming is happening. Uh, but you also want to recognize, recognize and reward staff who are achieving and delivering, and in particular if they're going above and beyond um, what you're asking them. You want to make sure that you're actually letting them know. But one of the great things is that your pro the probational period can definitely be your friend because this is where you can let somebody go who really is just not fitting well. And especially, you want to definitely give um, your staff a chance to grow, but you definitely want to make sure that they are um, definitely fitting in and that they are there for the right reasons and the right fit. Sometimes some people are just, they're incredible, but they aren't necessarily the right fit for the organization at that particular time. Um, so you want to make sure that you, you use that, that uh, probationary period. And um, at the moment, those what we're pretty much done. So we have time for questions that we can ask. Uh, we can try and answer them as much as possible. Um, but as you know, as you can tell, when you're working with staff, all of these different things come into play. Um, so if you have any specific questions, feel free to put them into the chat, and both uh, Anna and I will try and answer them for you. Uh, and we know that not necessarily everything can happen that we've suggested here. There are definitely some ideas and jumping points where you can move from and start thinking towards uh, being able to make sure that you're retaining staff. Mm -hmm. so.